Scripture this morning is Judges 4, 1 through 16, and 5, 1 through 5. After he had died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. The commander of his army was Sisera, who lived in Herosheth, Hagioim. Because he had 900 iron chariots fitted and had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years, they cried to the Lord for help. Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Labatoth, was leading Israel at that time. She held court under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country of Ephraim. And the Israelites came to her to have their disputes decided. She sent for Barak, the son of Abinonim, from Kadesh and Naphtali, and said to him, The Lord, the God of Israel, commands you, Go, take with you 10,000 men of Naphtali and Zebulun, and lead them up to Mount Tabor. I will lure Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his troops, to the Keshon River, and will give him into your hands. Barak said to her, If you go with me, I will go. But if you don't go with me, I will not go. Very well, Deborah said, I will go with you. But because of the way you are going about this, the honor will not be yours. For the Lord will hand Sisera over to a woman. So Deborah went with Barak to Kadesh, where he summoned Zebulun and Naphtali. 10,000 men followed him, and Deborah also went with him. Now Heber the Kenite had left the other Kenites, the descendants of Hobab, Moses' brother-in-law, and pitched his tent by the great tree in Zananim near Kadesh. When they told Sisera that Barak, son of Abinanim, had gone up to Mount Tabor, Sisera gathered together his 900 iron chariots and all the men with him, from Herosheth, Hegoom, to the Kishon River. Then Deborah said to Barak, Go, this is the day the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone before you? So Barak went down Mount Tabor, followed by 10,000 men. At Barak's advance, the Lord routed Sisera and all his chariots and army by the sword. And Sisera abandoned his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and army as far as Herosheth, Hegioim. At the troop of Sisera fell by the sword, not a man was left. On that day, Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinanim, sang this song. When the princes in Israel take lead, when the people willingly offer themselves, praise the Lord. Hear this, you kings. Listen, you rulers. I will sing to the Lord. I will sing. I will make music to the Lord, the God of Israel. O Lord, when you went out from Seir, when you marched from the land of Edom, the earth shook, the heavens poured, the clouds poured down water, the mountains quaked before the Lord, the one of Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. The word of the Lord. Friends, I feel like I need to be just upfront with you to begin with so nobody's disappointed. If you were hoping that all of the series, all the sermons through the series of Judges were going to involve pointy daggers and potty humor from the pulpit. That was a once and done. That is a Pastor Greg Ehud special, okay? It will not continue. What will happen, I hope, in the pulpit, uh, at least today and every time that we look at this, is we're going to continue to see what Judges shows us. All right, Judges gives us uh, kind of two windows, friends. First, it gives us a window, a perfect picture view into who the Lord is, into God's heart. And it's the kind of view here in Judges that is so uh, astounding that it's almost blinding. Uh, it's, it's kind of like if you've ever been at the ocean, you've been at the seashore on a really bright sunny day, and it, the sun is just shining, it's reflecting off of the water, it's reflecting off the sand to such a point that you've you got to put on sunglasses, you can't take it in. 
That's the picture you get of God through the book of Judges. And we've already seen, when you, when you look at God in comparison to how people are described in Judges, we see first um, God's outrageous patience. Right? We see that God is so incredibly patient that it is mercy that overflows when you poke him. But you also see things like what we saw last week and we're touching on this week and into next, that God chooses the most unlikely people, friends. He chooses people like Ehud, the lefty, and women. Who knew, ladies? <laughs> people like Deborah, and we'll see next week that he uses Jael. And God uses these women, the most unlikely people in their culture and in their time, to make him seen and him known. But Judges also gives us a window, a picture that um, this one you'll want to shield your eyes from, not because it's so brilliant and so beautiful, but because it's so true and so awful. It gives us a picture, a window into us, to the depravity of human beings. Uh, we've seen already, just in the first couple chapters of the book of Judges, that we as, a, as people are so willing to turn our back on God. We will worship anything and everything the culture throws at us because we say that will give me significance or that will give me security. And what we're going to see today is that even when we do worship the Lord, we often worship some caricature of him. It's not who he is because we forget what God did and so we stop believing that he'll do it again. So let's set the scene here. Judges chapter 4 opens in verse 1. It says, after Ehud died, and under Ehud's reign, when he was judged, we we're told at the end of chapter 3, there was 80 years of peace. Because for 80 years, the people of Israel under Ehud, mostly, worshipped the Lord. They, they worshipped Yahweh. They surrendered to him. So they get peace for 80 years. But after he died, the Israelites once again did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord sold them into the hands of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Now the commander of Jabin's army was Sisera, who lived in Harasheth Hagoim, because he had 900 iron chariots and he had cruelly oppressed the Israelites for 20 years. They cried out to the Lord for help. So Israel serves God under Ehud. Ehud dies, and Israel does what we're going to discover they and we do all the time. When the, the person they looked to to point them to the Lord was no longer there, they stopped looking because they weren't actually looking at God. They were looking at Ehud. It's kind of like people who look at their favorite pastor, and when their favorite pastor leaves, they say, I'm done, because they weren't looking at God, right? They were looking at the person. So they looked at Ehud. Ehud's gone, and they stopped serving the Lord. And so God gets their attention. He sells them to a, a foreign a Canaanite king, Jabin. Frankly, we're not going to hear much about Jabin going forward. What we're going to hear about is the mercenary army that Jabin hired under Sisera's rulership. Sisera is the head of this mercenary army. And did you catch what he has at his disposal? He got 900 iron chariots. Now think tanks. In the ancient world, these iron chariots were our modern-day equivalent of tanks. And we got 900 of those bad boys coming down, coming against the people of Israel who can barely put together a shield and a spear for every man. They're in trouble. And after 20 years, they finally wake up, and they say, Lord, what have we done? And they ask for deliverance. This is where Deborah comes in. It tells us there in verse 4 that Deborah, who is a prophetess, is, is a judge over the people of Israel. And Deborah holds court under the tree of Deborah. Now, trees are amazingly significant in Scripture, and they're going to be important in this particular story. Deborah, sitting under that tree, is sitting under the figurative tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Like back in Genesis, God put the tree knowledge of good and evil, the tree of life in the garden, and Adam and Eve were to come to the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and ask the Lord to show them his will. Now, Deborah, as the judge, is doing that. The people of Israel, when they are, have questions about God's word and God's law, when they have disputes that they cannot resolve, they bring it to the Supreme Court. They bring it to Deborah, sitting at the figurative tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and she issues decree. But Deborah's tree, guys, is not just the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Figuratively, it's also the tree of life. Because most likely, Deborah was the Supreme Court. 
So she's the person that you brought, not your petty little squabbles to. She was the person that the main problems come to. She's hearing capital crime cases. And it is her responsibility to speak the word of the Lord and decide if people get to live or if what they've done is so wrong that they must die. And they're going to be executed there at that tree. Now my guess is that the people of Israel have come to the judge and they've said, for 20 years we've been oppressed by Jabin and by Sisera. Have they done enough that God can finally bring judgment? And Deborah says, yeah, they have. So Deborah sends word to Barak. And he must have been one of the leaders uh, in Israel. He certainly is one of the leaders in a tribe, a northern tribe, that is most being impacted by Sisera and his 900 chariots uh, meaning he and his friends, they got skin in the game. They need Sisera gone. And she sends for Barak, and Barak comes to her, and there at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, at the tree of life, the word of the Lord is spoken through the judge. And the judge says, Barak, here's what you're going to do, dude. You're going to get 10,000 men. 10,000 men, with any luck, you'll put some shields and some spears together, and you're going to go to the top of Mount Tabor. And there... Here's God's brilliant plan. He's going to lure Sisera and Sisera's 900 chariots plus all the people that come along with them right there to Mount Tabor. Now, there's some debate. Uh, there's some debate whether he was supposed to go to uh, the top of the mountain or to the plain uh, around the mountain. But here's the deal. Doesn't matter. Because either option is a scary plan. This is what Mount Tabor looks like today on Google Maps. Here's the top. This is the big valley in which Mount Tabor is located. And here's the little fact that Deborah knew and Barak knew, but you and I probably didn't know. Archaeological evidence would indicate that this mountain and the valley around it is where the Canaanites had their military training ground. Guess what that means? That means that all those chariot drivers, this is where they learn to drive their iron chariot. This is where they practice war. This is where they get ready to learn how to take out their enemy. This is stupid. Okay, God says, just to make sure we're on the same page, God says, Barak, here's what I want you to do. You take your 10,000 men on foot to the very place where all the Canaanites know how to drive a chariot. It's got chariot roads. They know it like the back of their hands. And if they're right, and he was supposed to take them to the top of the mountain, he's like, hey, show up. Why don't you be sitting ducks? This should be loads of fun. Because I don't know how much time you spend on the top of a mountain, but here's one thing I know. I say it to my best friend every time we hike. You realize we're going up this stupid thing. There's only one way down. Once the 10,000 men are at the top of this mountain, Barak and his 900 chariots can literally just make a circle. And they can wait. Because eventually, what goes up has to come down. That means that Sisera and his army can pick them off one by one. This is not a smart plan. So it's not all that surprising that Barak's response when Deborah says, this is what you're going to do, he says, now back to Deborah in verse 8, if you go with me, Deborah, I'll go. But if you don't come, I'm not going anywhere. Now, you got to analyze this response for a second. Because based off of Deborah's response to Barak, she's not pleased. She doesn't say back to Barak, oh, sure, that makes tons of sense. She says, very well, I'll go with you. But because of the way you're going about this, the honor won't be yours. The Lord's going to hand Sisera over to a woman. So Deborah goes with Barak to Kadesh. Now here's my thought. I don't think the problem that is reflected in Barak's response is that he fears the plan. That makes sense. If the man has, has half a military bone in his body, then he should be afraid of this plan. It's not a good one. But if only thing that Barak feared was the plan, if he just looked at this and said, this doesn't make a lot of sense, it is definitely not how I would choose to do it, and his boy, is it going to be a tough sell? But 
He believed that God had spoken it. And he believed that God was going to go with him and go before him. If he believed that God was mighty and God was powerful, if he believed that God was going to keep his word, then even though he was afraid of the plan, Barak would have gone. I think the issue is that Barak was afraid of the person. He was afraid God is setting him up and then going to let him down. He's afraid that he's going to get to the top of this mountain, he's going to get to Mount Tabor, and God's not going to be there. That God sent him on what is essentially a suicide mission, and then God's going to back up and say, whoops, that was dumb, good luck. Why else ask that Deborah goes? I don't know Barack's intention. Maybe he was looking at Deborah thinking, this will make like a hostage situation. You know what I mean? Deborah, God clearly loves you. He speaks to you. So if you come and you're here, God will have to intervene because he likes you. Or maybe he just looked at Deborah and he said, well, you're, you're kind of like a talisman. You know, if I have you with me, it's sort of like having God. So come, because I don't trust that God loves me enough to be present. That's kind of like the equivalent of there's something really wrong in your world, and so you call me and say, Pastor, I need you to pray. And I say, I would love to pray, but why do you need me to pray? And you say, because your prayers are better. Right? It was the same thing. I'm going to go into surgery. Preacher, I need you to be there. It's the hostage situation. <laughs> and like, if the preacher's here, God will do something. The issue is that Barack is not afraid of the plan, guys. It's that he's afraid of the person. The next week, we're going to talk about Sisera. We're going to talk about what God does actually do. We're going to see that it points straight to Jesus, and it's amazing. But I think before we go there, we need to camp here. And before we talk about Sisera and Jael and how God comes and he delivers his people in a way that is beautiful, we got to talk about the fact that I think most of us, if you're anything like me, function an awful lot like Barack. Where I know the truths about God, I, I, I've heard them, I've seen them, I've witnessed them, but when he says, all right, Kelly, we're going up this mountain, and he speaks, and I read his word, and he's got a lot of mountains in here. Mount Tabor looks better than some of the stuff he asked me to do. And I look at the mountain, and it's not that I'm afraid of the plan. It's that I'm afraid he's not going to be there. So I don't go. I think the first time I got confronted with, with my Barack-like tendencies, you like my really quality mountain, by the way? The first, that was a very loud laugh. <laughs> You'll get used to it. First time I got confronted with this, I think I, I was thinking about a tithe. This wasn't an issue for me when I was growing up because my mom did not believe in giving children allowances, right? My mom came from the school that said, it's your rent. I let you live here, you will work, you do not get paid to live in my house. So if, I, if there was money to put in the plate, it was because my grandma gave me a dollar, and it was grandma's dollar. I wanted to keep it, but it was okay to get rid of it. And so this happened for me more when I was in college. It was the first time that I actually had to sit there and think, I know that God commands me to trust him with my money. And, and just in case you're one of those people sitting here going, well, praise God, the New Testament doesn't use the word tithe. Let me just disabuse you one quick moment of thinking you're off the hook. Because you're right, it doesn't. The word tithe comes from the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, God's people were commanded to give at base 10% of everything they had. They gave it back to the Lord. They gave it to his temple for kingdom ministry to take place. New Testament does not command that we give our tithe. Do you know what the New Testament says? It says give generously in the same way that Christ gave his whole life for you. Now there is just no way. There is just no way <laughs> that what God means is cool, give less than the Old Testament tithe, you who have received Jesus Christ. Period. And I have this distinct memory of sitting in a giant parking lot, not a big one, like the, the giant grocery store parking lot, because my bank had an ATM there, looking at the, the little printout of how much money I had going, 
I can't do this. God, this plan is nuts. I cannot take 10% of what I give and give it back to you. And if I'm totally transparent with you, there has never been a season in my life where I haven't looked at that plan and said, this is scary. Because early on in life, it was, Lord, I got to save some money here if I'm going to have enough gas to get home from college to visit my mom. I remember one time doing it. I had enough money to put gas in the car to get four hours. I did not have any money to get home. And no college student wants to think you'll be stranded at home with your mom forever. <laughs> my mom didn't want it either. She gave me 20 bucks. <laughs> then it was... I need to put money down for rent uh, to be able to get an apartment. I got to do first month's rent, Lord. I can't give a tithe. And then it was, I really do not care for this apartment living. It's been great and all. I want to put down payment. I can't give a tithe. And then it was, oh gosh, a down payment comes with a mortgage and that dumb thing shows up every month. Now, I'd like to retire someday. And then I will be on a fixed income. There is literally no season in my life where the plan isn't scary. But when I sat in that giant parking lot and I looked at the receipt, the issue was not that the plan was scary. The issue was I didn't think God was going to meet me at that mountain. I was convinced he was going to leave me high and dry. I was absolutely convinced that he couldn't do what he promised. He couldn't accomplish more than 90% than I could with the 100. There are some of you sitting here today. You have not given a tithe. You don't even think about it. And it's not because you're scared of the plan. You're scared of the person. Maybe your mountain's got a different name. Maybe it's forgiveness. Maybe the thing that the Lord has spoken to you from his word is he says it again and again and again that you and I who are forgiven of everything are called to forgive someone else in front of us of the one thing. Even with the one thing's really hard. And friends, there are some of us today where the judge is saying, Go. You got to go to Mount Forgiveness. And from that mountain, you have to actually forgive the people who hurt you. And forgiveness means you don't rehearse it in your mind over and over and over again. Forgiveness means you don't bring it up in every conversation with the person or about the person. Forgiveness means saying, Lord, I trust you to execute judgment. And some of us, it's not that you're scared of the plan, you're scared of the person. See, some of us sound an awful lot like Jonah. You ever read the book? You get to chapter 4. Jonah's told in chapter 1 to go to Nineveh. Nineveh is his enemy, and I mean real enemy. Like, Jonah has watched people be murdered by Ninevites, probably his own family. And God says, go tell them the gospel. Go tell them they can repent and be forgiven. And Jonah, less than pleased, says, no, there's a big fish, there's vomit, so he goes... But when you get to chapter 4, he's told the people. And where you find Jonah in chapter 4 is he is sitting back, looking at the city of Nineveh, literally hoping that fire and brimstone will come down. And he says to God, this is the reason I didn't want to go. Because I knew you'd forgive them. Some of us won't go up the mountain because you're afraid of God. You're afraid that he won't judge like you. And he won't because he will judge perfectly. He, in his mercy, will, or in his wrath, will remember mercy. Maybe, maybe your mountain is uh, what St. John of the Cross calls a dark night of the soul. We would talk about it as a serious season of depression. St. John talked about these seasons of life that we enter into, and sometimes they happen because something happened, because um, the baby that you expected is stillborn because someone you love dies, because the diagnosis comes and it's terrifying, because you lost a job, uh, because a pandemic hit. Sometimes there's no reason. It just happens. And it's not, we're not talking a, an afternoon here. We're not even talking a week. We're talking a season. Some of us, the mountain that's in front of us, maybe you're in it right now. Maybe you're in the dark night of the soul. There's no joy. There's no peace. You couldn't see light anywhere. And it feels like I am here and I'm alone. And God's nowhere to be found. You know, sometimes we get in these dark nights of the soul, friends, and we forget who God is. That God's the one who does his best work in the dark. 
read the book of Genesis and you'll, you'll find when God talks about creation, it says there was the evening and then there was morning, right? Evening, morning, first day. And evening, morning, wake up, there's fish. Evening, morning, you wake up, there's the whole world has been created because when does God do his most creative, beautiful work? He does it in the dark. Some of you are in a dark night of the soul right now and you're not so scared of being in the dark, you're terrified that God has abandoned you because you've forgotten does his best work in the dark. Maybe the mountain is uh, being willing to stand when everybody around you bows. Do you know what happens when everyone around you is bowing to something in the culture and you're the only one standing? You're the head that's going to get cut off. There's a whole bunch of things in scripture, though, that call me in relation to our culture to stand when everybody else bows. Whether that is to walk in integrity, whether that is sexual ethics, it it really doesn't matter. You are called to it. And some of us, you know it, you read the word, and your gut pinches a little bit, and you go, I know I'm supposed to live differently at school or uh, at my job or with my family. i got to stand, and every time I bow, you're afraid. Not because the plan is scary. Because you're genuinely convinced that if you lose your job or you lose social standing or you lose fill-in-the-blank, God can't provide. You know, there are a million mountains. Point is that for every one of them, the reason you and I won't go up those mountains is because we're scared of the person. We're afraid God won't be there. And if we want our story to be different, we have to do what Barak didn't do. And what Deborah the judge reminded him. Because when Barak finally goes up on, the, on that mountain, verse 14, it says, Deborah then says to Barak, go. This is the day that the Lord has given Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone ahead of you? Hasn't God gone before you? Isn't he already here and he's going where you're about to head to next? <laughs> Friends, the, the reality is that you and I have a God who's gone before us. Do you know what God did on Mount Tabor? He just did Exodus again. He proved to Barak and all of those guys there that he's the same God who's always been, the God who's always gone before him, and he's never going to change. So think back real fast to Exodus. People of Israel have just left Egypt, and they're leaving Egypt, and the army is in hot pursuit, right? We have an army with chariots here. We have Israel here, and oh dear, we have a Red Sea that they cannot cross. They're sitting ducks. It's a suicide mission. Sound familiar? And when they get there, God proves to them that he is present, and he'll go before them. And he goes before them into the Red Sea, and the waters part, and Israel passes through because God goes before them. And when Israel gets the whole way through the Red Sea, God lures Pharaoh. He says, come on, buddy. And Pharaoh and his chariots, this shit's unfamiliar, ends up in the middle of the sand. Do you know what happens when you run a chariot in the middle of muddy sand? It gets stuck. And when the wheels get stuck, the people got stuck. And God let the Red Sea come back. And he wiped out the enemy. That's what God did here. In Deborah's song, in chapter 5, she says that when God lured Sisera and the 900 chariots there to the mountain, and they're there in the middle of the desert, that God caused it to rain. Do you know what happens when it pours the rain on a dirt road? Dirt road turns to mud. Guess what happens to chariot wheels? Oh, they get stuck. And when the rain falls off that mountain down into the river, the river rises, a flash flood takes place, and God wipes out the enemies. He just did it again. Because the God that went before Barak is the same God who went before them at the Exodus. But Barak only got to find that out when he went up the mountain. You're only ever going to get to know who God is when you go up the mountain. It's only when you go up the mountain to tithe or to forgive or to take the next step in your vocation or whatever it is that you get to see who God is. So here's the last thing you need to remember. Barak had a judge standing at the tree of life saying to him, this is what the Lord is telling you to do. Go to that mountain. 
because God wants to show you his power. You and I have a judge, way better than Deborah, at an incredibly different tree of life, who says to us, go up that mountain. And this judge, he's the one who's gone before you. There is no mountain that you're going to come to. There is, there is nothing that God's going to ask you to do. There's no plan that sounds scary that Jesus hasn't already come up against. If the mountain that you're terrified of, that God's not going to be present for you, is the dark night of the soul. The judge on this tree of life who's saying, go, is the same judge who went to the Garden of Gethsemane and was so scared of the darkness that was about to come that he sweat drops of blood. This is the same judge who, when he died, the whole sky went dark. This is the judge who got put into a tomb, and then the stone was rolled. He knows what darkness is. It's also the same judge who rose three days later. This is the judge who knows for a fact that God does his best work in the dark. And he's the judge sending you because he's already gone before you. If the mountain before you is forgiving somebody, the judge that's telling you to forgive, guys, he's the judge who knows the pain of being on the cross and saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He's the judge who paid for their forgiveness. And he's the judge who can be trusted to forgive because he's the judge who's already gone before you. Whatever it is that you're facing, he's already gone. And he's already made it to the other side. Which means that today, when you're afraid of the plan, the judge who's sending you is the judge who's been there. And what he did, he'll do again. The only way you're going to know how good he is, the only way you're going to know his power, is you go up the mountain and trust that this judge will still go before you. Let's pray together. As you come before this judge, here today at the foot of the tree of life, today you need to say to Jesus, you, you know exactly what the mountain is that he has told you to go, and you know why you haven't gone. And today you get to confess to him your fear. If today you need to ask him, prove to me that you're the one who goes before me, and ask him to show you. And if today you're ready to believe him at his word, then start going to the mountain. Because that's where you're going to find him. Father, pray for each one of my brothers and sisters to pray for myself today. Ask that you give, give to us the eyes to see where we're afraid of you. We're afraid to trust. We're afraid to obey. We're afraid to walk in faith. We're afraid to go to the mountain because we don't think you're going to be there or that we're going to like who we find. Jesus, I pray that more and more we would know that you're the judge who is trustworthy, that you, from the tree of life, when you command that we go, have already gone before us, are already there. And you'll see us through to the other side. Jesus, thanks for loving us. And pray these things in your name. And all God's people said.